Mitch Joel, thanks for thanks for so much for coming on. Um, I know that you're a, you're a humble person, so you might scoff at this, but I'm hoping that today when we talk, you can help me and some of the listeners figure out our lives a little. Oh, God. Well, I was hoping uh, you were going to help me do that. So <laughs> <laughs> now we're in a real. So pickle. now what? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, listen, um, um, of course, you know, you have someone on and you have to do the due diligence of at least, at least looking at some of the things that they've done in their life. And um, I, I look at your career and I see, I would call a kind of an untraditional path. Um, you know, you start in music journalism, magazine publishing, agency owner, author, and the list goes on and on and on. And um, I wanted to ask you, my first question would be, you know, how much of that was on purpose and how much of it was simply following what you felt was right at the time? I mean, it was both of those 100%. I think that that's what makes the career interesting. And I, I, I talked a little bit about it in my second book, uh, Control Out Delete, which is, you know, it's almost 10 years old now. Um, but the idea of, we sort of think of things as like, you know, you go through this sort of plotted life of school and high school and post-secondary education. Uh, and then you sort of think everything goes from bottom left to top right in terms of just the axis of, of, of movement. And then when you look back, the most interesting careers are typically very squiggly. So my whole thing was, you know, embrace the squiggly and embrace the fact that it's going to sort of go there and then go there and then come back and then won't work and then you'll figure it out. Uh, but it is true that I, I sort of was always holding two concepts uh, in my brain at the same time. One being that I'd like to be very, very rich. I don't know why that was a thing, but it really was when I was really young. I was like, I, I want to be, I didn't really want stuff. I just wanted to know I could, you know? Um, and, and the other one, it being on my own terms. And I think that comes from me being more of a sort of heavy metal punk kid uh, and sort of the irreverence that comes with that attitude because it's not just a music, it's a lifestyle. Um, and I sort of have always tried. And when I didn't try that, when I was going down the path that I thought, whether it's wearing a suit or just sort of following that sort of corporate, let's see what it's like to be part of an organization it wasn't clicking for me ultimately. It really wasn't. So I think it's both of those things, to be honest. I don't think it was an either or. And I think there's probably many other chemicals and ingredients in there that 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 add to to what the recipe eventually is. And, you know, when I was, I try to break down these concepts every week in my podcast where I get to interview uh, interesting people for sure. And at one point I was uh, having that conversation with Seth Godin, who we all know is the famed sort of marketing thinker and, and just thought leader. And he said, oh, you, you want to know the secret sauce? He goes, I, I don't even know the recipe for my own secret sauce. And it was, uh, as, as he is, it, it was a very profound statement where you realize people sort of want to know, like, how did you do it? And I don't think most people really know how they did it. I think it's a secret sauce and everyone has their own secret sauce and no one has the recipe. You, I think you, in a previous podcast, uh, you mentioned that, you know, careers are best looked in, in looked at in hindsight that, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, when you look back at something, maybe you can identify the reasons why, but while you're in the thick of it, you're not quite sure why you made the decisions you, you did when you were growing up and like, did you have influences in your life that you, you knew that you were going to kind of take this entrepreneurial path or this untraditional path? Or are you kind of the black sheep of your family? Well, well, no. And again, it's a sort of mixture of things. There wasn't really one person. It was just who I was and where I was. You know, I come from a very great family, uh, middle class. Father was a pharmacist, mother bookkeeper. Uh, but we lived in a more affluent neighborhood. And I think the influence really came, and maybe it's a bit of ego, and it's very hard as a Canadian to claim you have any ego. <laughs> but I would see a lot of my friends, uh, and I would look to see what they had. It was quite materialistic, you know, where I lived. And I just thought, these parents aren't that much smarter than me. You know, the things that they were doing to accumulate any form of, of wealth didn't seem out of reach. It's not like someone's a brain surgeon. You're like, well, gee, I don't know if I could do that. 
Mm-hmm. You know, they were selling baby clothes and, and they were just doing things that, that, that they did that afforded them a lifestyle. And for me, it was just more, I guess it was not just seeing it, but really seeing that a little bit of effort, ingenuity, you know, elbow grease, hard work, dedication, almost anything is possible. So it was more cultural, I think, than it was uh, academic. And it was more cultural than I think it was one or two specific people. As I got older, that changed dramatically. You know, when I started really being exposed to business books, which is through my friend Andy Nullman, who was the founder of Just for Laughs Comedy Festival, and then worked with him at Airborne Mobile, and to this day is one of my close friends and one of the smartest people I know. When he reintroduced me to business books, a lot of those authors became my mentors, and a lot of those authors became very inspirational in terms of both finding a voice for myself and also just how I think about work and business and education and all that sort of stuff. So that came you know, much later for me. I really was one of those people who left high school post-secondary saying, well, I guess we're done reading. Like that was enough, you know? <laughs> uh, and, and now obviously I'm, I'm an infovore and I'm a voracious reader of all things nonstop incessantly to the, probably the point where it annoys most people, but it, that's sort of my gig. Yeah. I think uh, in, in um, previously you might've mentioned that um, when you were, in music journalism and you decided that you were going to uh, try publishing that you started to get on the phone and talk to other publishers to to suss it out and I think it's interesting because there's a lot of people who I think who want to follow their dream but their their that fear is a major obstacle um, you know they're, they're afraid they're gonna fail or they'll fall flat on their face and that's a big deterrent for people to actually move forward and listening to you kind of just say, oh, I just casually called these, these, these publishers and said, I'm starting a magazine, I thought was incredibly bold. I'm, I'm going to guess that that was something that's kind of innate in you rather than in the wee hours of the morning, you, you know, being bolt upright at 3 a.m., being afraid that you might not be able to pull it off. I, yeah, I mean, it, when I think back on that action, and it really was just one action. I, I don't know where it came from because it wasn't innate in me to do that. I was writing. Uh, I was very young. And I also held a part-time job working at a store called Multimags, which is sold magazines and newspapers. And this is pre-internet. So, you know, these stores were hopping and bopping all day long. And as I was sort of sitting behind the counter when there was just a lull in traffic, I thought, I wonder if any of these publishers would actually spend time with me. And I literally went like physically through magazines and mastheads looking for a phone number, which many didn't have, but some did. And I, I I really do wish I should go back. I know I have the notebook where I started taking these notes and it is somewhere in storage. I wonder if the person and the magazine title is there, but there was one person who was basically publishing and editing a magazine on cottages, I think it was. And I think it was a Canadian magazine too. I was just surprised that there was a phone number next to the publisher, to be honest. And that person spent you know, a good chunk of time really walking me through uh, the process and how it works. I was kind of familiar with it, but it was just interesting to get their perspective. Yeah, then when I went down the road of physically printing, printers are, were, you know, were and still are fairly sophisticated. And, and the sort of Yes, you're paying them for a service, but at the same time, they're coming back and saying, you know, this file is corrupted. This thing is crap. This won't look good in black and white. You should do a spot color here. You should... All that guidance was, was really helpful. And that was a big shift for me in terms of salespeople because, you know, my general sort of allergic reaction to salespeople is like, you know, knocking on the door or phone calls and things like that. And that... I think made me a much better salesperson when I came into the agency world, just sort of thinking about being a value and a service provider and a shoulder and, and not looking for the sale, but looking to just always provide value, which again is, is, is definitely a gateway towards blogging and podcasting and publishing and everything that I do and did uh, and continue to do. So I think there are sort of a lot of connective tissues to certain moments, but I can't look at that moment and say to you that it was characteristic of me because I don't think it was at all. I just don't. You know, this, um, 
you know, the show is called The Moment That Changed Everything. And I look at your career, particularly now, I'm sure this is a thread throughout it, that um, you look at things and have a gut feeling that they're going to be big, like you talk about the infancy of the internet and just having that feeling. And, um, you know, uh, I don't want to call you like the, the, it makes me think of Simon Cowell, you know, it's just the guy who can identify talent and then bank on it and be right. And uh, uh, pro I won't press you on, uh, on maybe some of the failures in that, but um, do you feel like that that is a common thread um, that you, you identify things and you just have a good feeling that they're going to, they're going to be successful? Yeah, in fact, what I would say, and I don't know that I've ever been asked it in this direction, so it's interesting to, to self-reflect as, as I'm hearing the question, is that my frustration is that I didn't capitalize on the many other things that I saw happening and coming. And that was stuff like I saw the UFC before it was the UFC. Uh, I was working at one of the first search engines before Google. And in that, seeing everything from the Ebays of the world to, to the Google ad model, which we really did develop where we were, that was taken on by a whole bunch of other businesses to social network. I mean, it's, it's the ones that got away. I mean, even the story pre me entering the agency world. So I started an agency with three other partners. Well, it was already there, but I joined a short while after they started it called Twist Image. So the agency started in 2000. I joined about 2002, I think. And right before that, I had launched a record label with a business partner in Toronto, Greg Bello. And it was Distort Entertainment. And we are the people who signed Alexis on Fire and Dallas Green, which became City in Color. And a couple of other, other artists for sure. And, you know, I, I decided when the agency thing started becoming real, at least to me, and it felt like that was my path, that I sort of I, I sold back my, my share to Greg. At the time, Alexis on Fire hadn't broken. They were just, we just signed them. Uh, you know, we were very hopeful. But at the same time, I think we all looked at it and thought, what, what could this be? And just a loud, aggressive band. And we were fine with that. It was a small label. And I, you know, I, I left. I didn't stick around. And had I just stuck around a couple more months. And it's the same with so many things from mobile to, to digital, other digital businesses to even things like the UFC yeah, I was working with a coach who's now a world-renowned trainer, and I saw this business come along, and I could have done something in that space, and I just, I just didn't. So it's more that when Twist Image really started, and I, was, I really consciously went into it with the attitude of, I'm going to be like a Rottweiler, right? I'm not going to let go. I'm just going to hold on, and, I'll, and, for, and for once in my life, I'm not going to let go. And you know, now it being 2020, it's become more a part of my DNA, that idea of if I'm going to do something to stick with it and, and go down the path. Uh, but, but yeah, I do feel, and it, I think it does cause frustration for me that I, I can sort of see things. You know, like right now, the big one being smart audio or smart speakers. It's very clear to me that we are going to, live in a world where we are talking. I mean, if you even think about we're recording this during this pandemic and they're talking about contactlessness. So like when we pay, we're sort of tapping our phones and I'm like, yeah, I don't think that's the future. I think the future is going to be, we're just going to use our voice and that's going to be what we use to control. We won't touch things. We will control them with our voice. And it seems so natural and organic. And yet, you know, you watch the growth of Alexa, you watch the growth of Google home or Siri or whatever else it might be. And it seems so slow and long. I mean, e-commerce would be another one where just early, I mean, literally I'm talking about the mid nineties where I was like, this is so obvious, you know? So yeah, I was there before Amazon. I, I saw this and I'm watching so many businesses now that could benefit from it, which makes me so bullish, even though now it's the largest company in Canada, but on Shopify, I'm just so bullish on what they're doing and what they're trying to do. And even with that, we all go, well, it's the largest market cap in Canada. And, and, and but well, yeah, but e-commerce still, you know, now it's at 30% because we're all trapped at home. We'll see what happens when it opens up. But usually it was floating around only 15% of all commerce, the digital. So, so you're right in that to me, it seems all these numbers seem low. What are we doing here? Even podcasting, so I've been podcasting forever. And I just, all the things I look at, I'm like, it's still being treated like it's, you know, the indie press. Granted, again, we're, we're talking in a moment where, Joe Rogan just got probably a couple hundred million to go to Spotify. 
Right. But but still, it's still small. The vast majority of people don't know and, and aren't engaged. So, yeah, I I think I mean y- you look back and 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 for it, we'll take the UFC for instance. You look at it, you knew that there was something there. Um, I'm, I've I've been a big UFC fan in the past too, and and watched those UFC ones and twos and and um, and then you see what's happened to it um, after it it uh, start after it started, but. What do you make of these businesses? Clearly, there are other businesses involved in, in, in like things that don't end up being um, a huge success, but they're kind of within the category. And to your point, to your last point there, too, um, what do you think happens that something seems like it should be more popular than it is? Um, and yet no one jumps on board. I, I mean, I had a long conversation with a, a guest on Michael Brenner who talks about um, brands self-publishing and I still can't believe that more brands are doing, aren't doing more of it. And I, I sit there and I go, I don't understand it. The technology has gotten to a point where it, it, it's really not a barrier anymore. And yet it's still, it's, it seems like it's gaining some momentum, but why isn't it happening more? And I don't know if I can, I don't know if you can explain why yeah, uh, I think I can. it takes time. <laughs> yeah, sure. No, I, th- I think I can because as you do these things, you realize that they are actually quite creative ventures. And when you recognize that something is a creative venture, I think you need to then self-acknowledge that it's some kind of art form. Running a business is a very complex art form. And every aspect of, of making it work is very nuanced. I mean, what we're doing right now is a, a great example of my current struggles with this. I mean, traditionally, what do I do? I, I write, I publish on my six pixel stuff or elsewhere. I have a podcast, which is uh, not with video. Uh, and I get up on stages and I speak. So we live in a very interesting moment in time where people will go back to work and they will go back to their office. I can't even imagine at this moment in time, me getting on a plane and speaking in front of 3000 people sitting shoulder to shoulder. It just doesn't compute right now. Do I think we'll have concerts and, and conferences? We better because that's my life's blood and I need that desperately. And so I'm doing what many of my peers are doing, which is this sort of stuff. Like suddenly I have a nicer camera and suddenly I'm buying different types of software to manipulate that camera and different types of microphones and technologies. Like, I don't even know, is this microphone good? I've got five others that I still have to try out and run through. And it went from me getting up on a stage and someone clipping a lav on to me and me plugging in my laptop to being like camera and lighting and audio and video and streaming and this. Now, I'm lucky that I have a proclivity for this space. I've been doing this sort of digital communications thing basically since it existed. So I'm more comfortable with it, but it's not my metier. It's, it, it's not. And so even the work that I'm doing right now through this camera to speak to you I'm not in 100% comfort. I'm sure there are people who know how to do you know, their name underneath and bumpers and all this sort of stuff and how to flow and how to transition or, or just even looking into this sort of cold space, which is just a sort of eye and a little light next to it and be comfortable doing it. That in and of itself is art and it's an art form. And so when we talk about why isn't every brand doing this? And listen, I spent 20 years yelling at the top of my lung, across multiple forms of media. I think I'm learning as I get older that it's not easy, that it's actually complex, and that to do it well and to have a voice takes time and effort and energy and quality. And again, this is one of those things where, sure, anybody can go live on Facebook. Go ahead. I mean, absolutely. But to captivate an audience, to keep them coming back, to be compelling with your content, to do it in a fantastic way. I was just seeing a, an article the other, I think it was an ad age about wall, you know, W A H L they do the hair buzzers and stuff like that. And how they invested last year or the year before in all these how to videos. And of course, now that this happens and people have to cut their kids hair and cut their own hair or how their spouse cut their hair or partner, or whatever it might be that there, these videos have gone extremely viral to a cer- certain degree. And, and she like great thinking, you know, but, but I don't know, one, how good these videos are. They're probably good. I, don't, I haven't watched them, but I was just reading the article thinking, 
that skill of even doing a video like that when you when you own that brand and that sort of legacy product that everyone knows it's not easy like just because you can manufacture hair buzzers doesn't mean you're going to be compelling in doing a video about how to demonstrate it. now yes i ran an agency you understand the space better than anyone you can pay for that service too absolutely but we all know that as an agency person that you are then sort of abstracting the brand away a little bit you're sort of telling the story at arm's length versus it really being you, your people, your founder. And there is an art in that. And it goes on and on. And so I, 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 I've been more empathetic to that trope only because I'm recognizing in my own faults how challenging each medium is and how challenging it is to be really compelling within it. Do you think it's a choice now, though? I mean, can brands really choose not to do it? It seems to me that um, while it might be uncomfortable and or there are obstacles to overcome, and in other words, you might have to outsource that those abilities to someone who maybe has more experience. It seems to me that that's a train that one must get on now, because um, while there's more than one way to tell a story, of course, it just seems as though that's where it's going. So the sooner that you can develop that skill and, and uh, you know, trial by fire or, or attempt to do that, the better, no? No. No. Well, I, I mean, I look at it, like I love brands and I follow brands really passionately. And I think that some of the brands that are the most compelling today are actually letting the influencers and the fans do it because they're doing it better and they're doing it with more conviction. Two that come to mind uh, are Lego and Funko. I don't know if you're familiar with the Funko pop characters that are mm. sort of like these little collectible things. This brand seems to just be doing everything right. They're getting cool brands in, so they're doing Star Wars and they're getting cool icons in, like, you know, they'll do like a Captain Crunch little sort of statue. So it's not a toy, it's like a collectible. It's in all the stores. I'm sure if you looked up Funko pop, figures you'll be like i know exactly what this is and it is literally geared as an engine of marketing you would just see no other reason to not be creating tons of content and the truth is people love it and collect it and want to tell the story and they're doing it so much better than they are that i think they to a certain degree are letting their fans become these massive celebrities and influencers on their own lego is very similar i mean really they, they put out great content and they sell online and they're great but at the same time, if you really look at the voice of the brand, it seems to be your peers. So I, I just feel like there are other avenues depending on what the brand is. Now you might go, well, we're B2B and heavily procurement. And I would say fine, but my guess is that if people are really interested in what you do and the complexity of it, I'm assuming testimonials play a better story role than you telling the world how great you are. And I think it's, it's a delicate balance but I'm just trying to provoke with an additional thought that might be sometimes in this world, you can just provide great assets, a great product, a great service, and have the community, the customers really take on the torch of driving it forward. And again, I, I see it in, in less exciting brands too. It's not just the sort of cool, well, that's a cool brand that's sort of like a Comic-Con brand. So I'm not sure. I just think there are many different ways to really think about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, uh, you know, when I look at your career and I look at what you've done, I, I find it more common that creative people in the advertising business want to move to um, other creative forms rather than the opposite. And I see you kind of as someone who started in a much more creative forum, um, arguably a more respected forum, call it journalism or whatever. Um, and, and then move towards advertising. I'm not sure how people feel about, in general, feel about advertising now. I mean, it used to be this thing where it's, you know, we were just below a, a used car salesman in terms of trust and and um, how people felt about advertising. You've seemed to really embrace it. And, and even, even beyond that, you seem to really love it. Um, so... Um, why do you think that is? Why did you move towards it rather than being maybe someone who, who moved away from it? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would use the term journalism a little looser only because I was really interviewing rock stars. And, and while I would write poignant pieces from time to time, it was more that. That brought me into this sort of music world 
that brought me into the magazine world, that brought me into the media world. And when I started publishing, I realized that that's the intersection I'm really interested in, especially with the technology, was that intersection between brands, consumers, and technology. So like even the ad sales components of it, I, I really liked. So I always had it in me to sort of want to build brands. Where that comes from is, is anybody's guess. I just have always been interested in, you know, I always tell people, I, I love to shop, but I don't like to buy. I love going shopping. I love commerce. I love stores. I love merchandising, but I'm actually not that big of a consumer. I don't really spend a lot. I'm not a hoarder. I'm not really a collector even of, of much of anything. Um, I, I don't know where that comes from, but I, I definitely, I mean, maybe it's like I'm like a squirrel and I'm just easily distracted. Like, oh, look, there's a nut. Off you go. Maybe it's the flashing lights. Maybe it's the bigness of it. I, I don't know. But I think there is a lot of connective tissue between obviously the brands and the bands. I mean, that, that, that makes sense. The community that you build uh, as a musician is, is similar to the community I want to see businesses building. And then I think there's just been a sort of icon, well, constant flow of icons that really get me excited, whether it's brands like Apple and Amazon. I don't mean today, I mean the early days of sort of discovering this stuff to, again, brands like Funko or, or brands like Field Notes or, or Moleskine or, or, or name a book publisher that I like or, or, or. Why do I like them? Why am I attracted to them? Do I believe in the brand so much that I would buy other products and services from them? These are, are the telling points that I'm interested in. And I'm also a big, I'm very passionate about this idea of how, how, how do you not know that? Like, like when people say, like, what's the question? The question for me is always, how did you not know that? And I don't mean it in a condescending way to others. I mean it in a, what's the disconnect between you needing something, these five brands over here who do that, and you not knowing. And it's not, a, it's not a vacuum. It's not an air gap. It's just a fascination of if I can help connect dots, that's an interesting place to be. So agency life proved to be very interesting for me. Speaking proved to be very interesting for me. Me, me loving to write and wanting to share proved to be very interesting. So all of those things really make a lot of sense when you, when you sort of tack them on together. But again, I don't expect other professionals to have that area of interest, right? So that yeah. happens to be my certain proclivity. I mean, you, you posed that question, how did you not know? I mean, uh, you clearly have a passion for it. And through passion, I think it um, leads to um, doing a good job. You could argue that there's not too many people who do it very well. I think I have a friend of mine who uh, has a... Uh, a studio, an audio studio. So he's working on a lot of work for different brands. Um, I won't call it out, but there was one, it was kind of a granola bar of sorts or whatever. And they're, they're doing like a COVID-19 kind of, we're here for you kind of thing. And and I listened to that and I go, wow, I mean, even, e even a big brand like this is still getting it so wrong that they're of kind of a low involvement category. And Maybe you shouldn't be talking that way. Maybe there's some kind of other value you can bring within the context of the times we're in. So, I mean, would you agree with that, that there are just so few people who really know how to do it well um, in, in a business that seems as though gets it wrong more than it gets right? I don't know if I prescribe to that. I think there's a lot of brands that do it really well, that deserve way more recognition than they get. I think we tend to let the negative float up. Mm -hmm. And I also do believe that creativity can often get stifled in groups. Mm -hmm. And I saw this as an agency person, you'd sort of look at the strategy, whether it was ours or others and go, this is great. And then in execution and in approvals, it just gets watered into whatever it becomes. But to answer your question more specifically, I just think about like, you know, show and tell. It's great. Show and tell is the greatest day ever, wasn't it? Who's going to bring in what? What are they going to show us? What are they going to tell us? What stories? Or they'll show something and they'll say something you thought is different. And wow, it's, mm. it's amazing. And brands don't show and tell. They either show or they tell. Mm. And, and, and it, it's that type of attitude that just changes it entirely. So I, I think that the brands that show and tell 
and I mean that for like in in that authentic, almost naive, uh, almost very childish way, are the ones who you really feel. I mean, a great example that would be Patagonia. You know, they show and tell, and they don't make you feel like if you don't have the latest vest, you're a loser. They actually make you feel if your vest is 40 years old, you're doing it very, very right. You know, the idea is that you should be wearing the vest that you got from your father's father, you know, and if not, send it back and, and we'll send you a new one. Like, mm. I, I just like when the values, when, when the spirit of it, the essence of the brand is demonstrated in both the show and tell categories, not in one or the other. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, do you feel like this time is really exposing, um, has, is making brands that are doing it well really shine and those who maybe aren't doing it quite as well look even worse? Well, I just think it's, that's when we get into tactical things. And in a, in a tactical world, I, th I still think you have to sort of zoom out and go, so what is, what is this sort of advertising component of what we're seeing? One is brand storytelling. You got to tell a great story. The other one is very much lead gen, right? It's like, or, or direct response would be a, another way to look at it. And I've spoken about this before. Now, if I were to say to you being a smart, wise person, what percentage of a brand should you put on brand storytelling versus lead gen versus direct response? You'd probably say 50-50 you know, to be fair. You'd probably say if you want to sell the brand, you've got to have a much better story ultimately because ultimately in the end, they bought the story. And yet if you look at it, we live in a world of clicks, clicks that don't mostly work. And that is all lead gen and direct response driven. And so it becomes somewhat anemic in today's world and unfair a little bit for us to criticize because most of these businesses have either been shut down or locked out for several months. And this is just a terrible time for everybody. And so when the lights come back on or if they're on a little bit, where are they going to go? They're going to go to direct response and lead gen. Uh, e even on the story selling side, again, you're, sh you're seeing it from more of the tell than the show and tell. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is it comes off as that feeling of, well, that's a bit inauthentic. But if the stories were better and they were really showing and telling from the brand side, I think you'd, you'd find it quite compelling. Uh, but I feel that they're going to be moving all the way to the right on that direct response lead gen side they will somehow lose a bit of that brand storytelling. And to a certain degree, it, it makes you homogenized. It takes you from that famous blue ocean into the bloody Red Sea. It takes you from being unique and having a voice to being competitive or a competitor. So there's a lot of mitigating factors that happen when we think about what's a brand to do today. And as I sit here, like you do, looking at my inbox with an invite every other day to a webinar about you know, surviving brands in a COVID-19 world, I kind of eye roll because I don't think there's a sort of path. I think each brand needs to self-reflect and think about what their brand story is and how much effort they should really be applying to that, while at the same time recognizing they have a real job here in terms of lead gen and direct response as well. And figuring out that balance when there's not a lot of money, people have been furloughed and laid off, and we don't really know what customers are going to think when the lights come on, right? Like we have to hold in our brains the concept of, hey, I looked at my visa and I didn't spend any money but on groceries and life is pretty good and I don't need all that stuff I was spending before. Or we have a situation like in Seoul, Korea, where it's like, you know, rage shopping once they opened up the doors again, everyone just went like Black Friday nuts. We don't know uh, how it's going to unroll. I hope it's somewhere in between for, for everybody in the economy. So I don't look at this moment as a great indicator of winners and losers. I think most are really trying to, to, to thrive and survive. And it's funny, you know, right before we spoke, I was listening to an interview on CNBC uh, with the new CEO over at Walmart and just them taking both the criticism of the world and then sort of seeing what they are doing in a good way to help. It's, it's interesting. I mean, is it fair that all these small businesses are closed while Walmart operates? Is it fair that they have this surplus and, you know, they're responding with, well, we have Sam's Club and we have a lot of our customers are small businesses and we're trying to help them. And there was no justification one way or the other. It was a very smooth interview. But these are very philosophical questions that we have to ask as we travel down this road of our brands doing it well. I think it would be hard to criticize Walmart in this moment because 
we wouldn't have toilet paper or groceries for the most part for a lot of people if they didn't have their size, scale, and supply chain management opportunities. At the same time, we have to look at this and go, did they actually put the final nail in a lot of these mom and pop stores and smaller businesses? Yeah, I mean- To, I, to be continued, right? Like we don't know. For sure, yeah. And I think, I mean, everyone accepts that during this period of time that, that business, the, the rules of business are kind of being rewritten. Historically, you see pandemics where on a global scale, it seems to, to spur on a lot of innovation. Um, you've alluded to in this interview, uh, um, you know, in a small way, the, the, you know, a technology that you might see moving forward. But have you thought more about, you know, what could be on the horizon um, in terms of innovation post, post coronavirus? Well, this is this, you know, you know it, putting the negative, which is massive aside, this is all I was right again. <laughs> you know, this is one of those moments where I've been talking about digitization since the 90s. And I really do think that this is critical mass now. We have very, very young kids, unfortunately, on screens all day. And I say that really sincerely. Like, I think it's really unfortunate that our, our, our young, like, we're sitting here thinking that our kids are thriving with homeschooling and at this level, we are not. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other side, we're seeing, you know, and daily I'm dealing with this personally where friends are asking about things like getting iPads and tablets into elder care homes uh, and, and they are and older people are on it. Uh, if you have a, a parent or, or a family member who's older, you've either set them up with online grocery shopping or, or you're doing it for them or they're doing it themselves primarily. And that to me sends us down this path of finally being in the place where we really have everybody on board on this. Do I believe that, that our nature and our habits in the past couple of months will be permanent in terms of how we do this? I don't think it'll be permanent. I think we, we miss a lot of the social aspects and connective aspects of what, again, shopping, not buying, shopping has, has given us. So when I look at this space, I'm, I am quite bullish. And I do think that there's tremendous opportunities and tremendous ideas. I spent a lot of my time now, because I'm not on stage, so I've got about a third of my life back uh, speaking to people and doing things like this. And I did one with uh, an independent retail association just last week. Uh, they deal with music stores. And just the ability for them to go onto Facebook and say that if your kid has been practicing for school, come on Zoom and we're going to tutor them for free. Just want to help out. Got it. We got our people here anyways. You know, you want to have a walkthrough on the store uh, on Zoom. You're looking for something. You need a teacher uh, for, for an instrument. You, I mean, just think it, it's boundless. We, we're going to create videos. We're going to, so many ways for products to offer services. So many ways for services to offer products. And in between that, the ability to build some form of subscription or consistency, you know, conversational model never been better. And it is, I agree with you. I think that the innovation that we can see again, B2B, B2C, small, medium, large is, is absolutely astronomical. My real, my real fear here is that we've seen a lot of it happen out of desperation for these businesses going under. And my real fear is that when things have some sense of normal, some are questioning whether they'll be a normal, whatever that looks like. My fear is that they're just going to go back to the way they did and start removing these fascinating new ways to stay connected and to sell and to engage. So I'm, I'm hopeful that th this moment provides these new business models, not just business models that are substituting for our main one. Uh, do I believe that they'll stick to it? I, I, I get, I get worried when I, when I, when I see that, but I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. Yeah. It's fascinating. I think there, I mean, if you take, uh, education, for instance, you take these big, big institutions. Um, I mean, I'm, a, I'm the first one to admit, like, I can't believe that I can just turn on YouTube and watch a, a Harvard lecture and get kind of this education free on YouTube. I mean, I can't believe that they even allow access because isn't that what all the tuition money is for? No, um, but that's no. not, that's yeah. not, yeah, no, yeah. What, what, what you're getting um, is is a very small part of what is ultimately a much bigger experience. So 
look, I'm having this conversation daily. I've got young kids. I sit as a public director for the local library here. So all of these conversations I am, I am in on and, and thinking very, very deeply about. And my, my self-reflection being someone who spends, you know, most of their year, you know, 40 to 60 times a year on a stage, which means I'm at an event, whether it's a corporate event or an association event, I also go. I only go to a handful, but one that I've been going to for over 10 years has been the TED conference, which takes place usually in, in Vancouver. And when people talk about the price of it, because it is expensive or, or the value of it, hey, they just post the videos online. Like, what are you going for? I can honestly tell you that from my experience of the physicality of being a keynote speaker and then going to this conference and others, that the content is about 5% of the experience. Mm. You know, it's about everything from buying the books and prepping your notebooks and thinking about who you're meeting and planning for your coffees and the breaks in between and the conversations before and the dinners after and the moments in the airport and on and on and on that create the experience. Why would you go to any conference, right? They could just upload the person talking like this to video and say, watch it whenever. We go also because it's social. We, 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 then this goes back to school. Um, yeah, I don't really know you professionally and what you've done, but I can tell you that I spend a lot of my work alone building decks and writing and producing podcasts and things like that. But my real success in terms of modeling comes when I'm with people and I'm hearing other things and different things. And that the truth is, I don't think I've been all that creative and inventive sitting here primarily alone. I mean, I get to put things in my ears like podcasts and, and things in my eyes like words, but I... I'm quickly re-realizing how much social interaction and how much happens in the physicality of just going and being and doing. So right now, teachers are, well, teachers, school administrations maybe are sending out that trope of, you know, it's online learning and here we go. And I would make the argument back that this isn't even close to online learning or education and that you watching a YouTube video for an MBA uh, class at Harvard or Stanford or wherever it might be is, is good. It's filling some stuff up in your brain. It's better than watching Tiger King or whatever on Netflix, mm -hmm. but it's not an education. There's many, many dynamics. It's like saying, you know, my career is the work. I, I, I just don't think that that's true and or fair because we know more. We know that when I send you away to that conference and you come back, you've got a whole bunch of other things going on now rather than just a handful of ideas or notes to share with the team. And I just want to be very careful that we don't, uh, that we don't uh, sort of atomize everything down to the sort of what was the asset ultimately. I mean, anybody can buy a pen, but you buy certain types of pen and certain colors because it makes you feel a certain way. And I bet you write differently when you have a pen that you prefer. So if it's just a pen, it's just a pen. And then it's a, all it is is a game of diminishing returns where you're looking for the cheapest. And there are some people in certain products where we do do that. But overall, I think that if, if we atom, atomize education down to the teacher standing in front of me, I think we're actually missing the real point of what an education does. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I have three, three boys and, and um, you know, the younger they are, uh, the more difficult it is. You raise such a good point. I mean, uh, you know, part of being in school is, you know, everyone has to understand that you're growing up at the same time, which is a whole other thing, right? And just being away from mommy and daddy. Yeah. I mean, you know, to me in all this, we're now hearing about, you know, the summer camps going away. And I don't know, again, how you were brought up, but whether it was working, in, whether it was going to day camp, going to sleepaway camp, being a counselor, being a counselor in training, these were massively influential moments that make people who they are. And I think even just the idea of independence, being amongst your peers, having another adult instruct or talk or give you, I'm not a teacher. My kid is not a teacher. That is a very, very specific art hmm. and process. And to just abdicate it, because, well, it's just an example of, of math or grammar in a notebook that anybody can look at. Yeah, I would, I would fight that a bit more hard, hardly, it would, you know, and, and by the way, if you even think about brands, think about what we talk about, right? People don't buy brands. They want to experience them. People don't want to buy things. They want to buy experiences. So if we just say that any form of education is simply 
that content and it can be watched on a screen. I mean, it's, first of all, it's absurd if you just think about it in terms of music. Right. So you, name a band that you love and then think about how, how many times you've gone down the rabbit hole on YouTube for that band. And now tell me if that is even close to when you get to see them live. Is it even close? Right. Yeah. It, it's a good point. I mean, when you when you think about this, I mean, everyone tosses around this term, the new normal. Um, and I think most people see it in a negative fashion. We've talked about maybe some very innovative things that probably should come out of this experience. But, um, you know, human beings, I mean, we like to look back and kind of romanticize things. And I think everyone's got this feeling like, but I want it to be the old normal. Um, I'm gonna, there's gonna be parts of it that um, I don't, I don't want to let go. Um, and certainly businesses have to look at that in the same way. I mean, I, I'm, I don't think that businesses um, that aren't thinking about a new way of looking at their business post coronavirus are, are necessarily doing themselves a service. Um, and, and yet I can understand from a human perspective that there's a resisting of it because, you know, it's only been, well, I don't know, nine weeks or so, but we, we still have these pangs of wanting to do all the things that we used to do. So, you know, yeah. Well, I so, so here's, I mean, I, I literally just came off of publishing a piece and, and, and maybe this information will be helpful to you. And I say that because I'm projecting, I'm hoping it's helpful to me when I do this stuff. Right. I think the new normal is, is just too big for us. It just, it just immediately sends us into stress and that stress will, will lead to anxiety and panic and that anxiety and panic will lead to post-traumatic stress disorder. And what I'm sort of dancing around is this idea, forget the new normal, but what about the new narrative? And what the new narrative does is it allows us to look at what we do and it doesn't change, you know, again, part of this comes from, I, I, I recently had Simon Sinek in conversation, who's known for finding your why. Uh, it, it hasn't been published yet, it'll, it'll come out soon, but he was talking about this idea that like, you know, we all sort of assumed that like normal was this thing we control. And it never was. And all this pandemic has done is really highlighted at a big scale how little control we really have over almost everything. And, you know, I have to look at it very seriously. I mean, you know, I'm joking about a third of my time back, but this has been quite traumatic for me to not be able to imagine my work. It's been very traumatic to just watch everything completely go away. I mean, I'm lucky that I'm stable in many other parts of my life that it doesn't impact me. But I have some friends who do this for a living, who speak for a living, who are literally getting jobs because they don't even know when this is going to come back. And what, what I think we have to say is not that I'll just pivot and become a virtual speaker, as I don't know that that's the answer. But what's important is to not say, well, I'm a speaker and that's gone. And now what I'm thinking more is I help people decode the future. That's on my website. That's my marketing. It's my branding. It's my narrative. So does that only happen on stage? No, it happens in articles, it happens in conversations like this, it happens in my podcast, it happens maybe in other products I haven't released, maybe another book, maybe maybe an online course, maybe building a mastermind, maybe, maybe, maybe. It doesn't change who, it doesn't make this abnormal. It's still normal, this is still what I normally do. How I do it, when I do it, that might change. And the real thing for brands to loop this back to Simon Sinek is the why shouldn't change. Maybe the how and when changes and shifts a little bit, but the why is still the why. And so we need to be able to hold on to that and figure out how do we deliver our why? Has the delivery mechanism for the why changed? So I keep repeating the story in other media formats, but the local sushi chef that is now not just exclusive to his 40 seats twice a night, but is now delivering for free. That might now do sashimi Sunday, and that might hop onto a Zoom call and show you how to cut it or, or explain to you each type of fish or, or whatever. All new business models, all good, all relevant, all still aligned with the why. And that's been a little bit more relieving for me. I hope, I hope it is for, for you as well, but we need to get rid of this idea of this new normal and, and maybe think about it more like what's the new narrative around what our normal is, because our normal is the same. That's a great answer. I, I think um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to 
end with this question. It's, it's more of a, a personal question um, for you. And that is when I look at all the things that you've done, um, uh, I think you've been really great at summarizing what it is that you do in a, in a very digestible way. It's not like going when I go through your LinkedIn and I, it's just pages and pages of things. You know, I, I noticed that everything is like a year to present all the way down, right? Yeah, it's uh, hard to just, sort. It seems terribly uh, overwhelming um, to me. Uh, and, you, and you've actually alluded to something in this interview about maybe uh, a, a frustration that you might have with yourself about maybe being distracted and moving on to the next thing. Do you ever think about your career and wonder what it would be like if you were more hyper-focused on a single discipline and where that would have taken you? And maybe you could uh, make it, maybe you could answer it within the context of people out there who might, um, you know, suffer from the same thing of, of maybe cutting bait when they should have uh, invested. It's a, it's a great question. And I, I think it also requires some clarity, you know, Twist Image, the digital agency, when I said this, I'm doing this was 2002. And I left two years ago, uh, so 17 years, uh, I'm not 50 yet. So you can do the math on how much effort and energy is, is, was put into that. And then even before that, if you look at the real sort of what I'll call full time work, I was never any, the only time I was not there for a year is when I was either fired, it wasn't the right fit, which happened once, or I decided it wasn't the right fit, which is only twice in my career. I think holistically, when you look at it, what you do see is someone who's really stuck with it basically since the late 80s, uh, in, in its truest form. And, you know, when I think about the LinkedIn profile, it's true because in and of itself, what it took for me and my business partners to get Twist Image to having the exit we had and having it now exist as Miram and, three, you know, 3,000 people across 30 countries and one of the big parts of the Wonderman Thompson network, which I'm, I'm really proud of, and I had very little to do with it, just sort of did its thing, is I, I realized within that, that it takes a lot of things to make me a president or CEO or whatever. And for me, it was the blog, which I've been doing basically multiple times a week for 15 plus years. Podcast once a week, which has basically been 15 years of doing that. I've been able and blessed to go on the radio every Monday morning and talk about this space, seven plus years of doing it. Uh, you know, Canadian Marketing Association, we got very involved in the early days. I went on to become the chair of the board uh, and then stay on and do other things if, if, they'll, if they'll have me. So if anything, I think that my career has been the opposite of that. It's been a career of really focusing on what I love and then extending it into all the other things that give me satisfaction. So I don't look at writing a blog post or an article as, oh, I got to write today or, oh, I got to do an interview. In fact, I'd say it's the opposite. I only do the stuff I really, really want to do. And I actually will, will sort of pass off the stuff I'm not great at or good at or competent. That's either a partner or, or someone within the organization. Those are the lessons that I think will get people a lot further. The challenge that I have is, and that I think you're right, is that people tend to cut bait for a title, for more money, for what they believe to be a different opportunity. And when I meet with people like that, which I do a lot, my general sentiment is it's very hard for me to see your excellence when I've never really seen you deal with the worst. And I don't mean the worst people. I mean the worst situations, clients leaving. Uh, you may not be able to make payroll. Uh, you, maybe you did something that put you in a situation where they're not sure about you. How did you dig yourself out of that? That is more of the reality. And that ties back more to my mixed martial arts and, and that world where, you know, you stand in, in, in the ring and you spar and you get punched in the face or you punch someone else in the face. You realize very quickly who you are and who they are. And there's a lot to learn in, in that part. And so when I talked earlier about, you know, my friend Andy Nellman and, and actually got fired from his company and he, he jokes about it. I joke about it too. Uh, it really was one of the greatest learning experiences, like that tail between your legs and going, what now? Do I want to go back to another business that might do this again? Do I want to start my own thing? Uh, what, what did I take from it? And I, I took so much more than that moment. I, I, learned, I learned about people like Tom Peters, which led me to people like Seth Godin, which led me to, you know, on and on. So it's more that. 
And I think that we need to be able to celebrate the time and effort that our team members and we as leaders put into those other things that also add a tremendous value to the business. I think that's a great place to uh, to stop, and I'll and I'll thank you so much for spending time with us. I, I'm 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 secretly really pleased today because I get to complete the trifecta: Stratton, you, and Tight. So it was it was it's great to have all all three of you guys. You 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 share this. Um, uh, you're just so gracious with your time and, and your advice. So um, thanks so so much for taking the time to uh, talk to us today. I, I really really appreciate it. Well, a couple of things. One is thank you. I've been following the series and I wish it wasn't this situation because you film it great in person. So I wish I could, I could have been there to do that run of it. Maybe we'll, we can do another one. Absolutely. And and Ron and Scott have been, you know, two incredible friends. And it's, it's uh, yeah, to even have my name mentioned amongst them always, always makes me feel very, very special. So, so thank you for that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks so much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and um, keep on keeping on. We're going to do it. This episode has been brought to you by the National Advertising Challenge, North America's only brief-based challenge that sends winners to Cannes, France. 